But I want to talk about a different spiritual gangster, different fighter, uh, who's my absolute favorite rabbinic authority. This is um, a rabbi who lived a long time ago by the name of Rabbi Zusha of Hanipol. Rabbi Zusha was a very curious character. He never referred to himself uh, by using the word I. He believed that only God could speak in the first person singular. He always said, well, Zusha feels very good today. And one day, just before Yom Kippur, his students came to him and said, Rabbi, we're wondering, it is a season of repentance, and, and it occurs to us, we don't really know how to repent. And he said, well, I don't know either. The students looked at him, you don't know either. You're the greatest rabbinic light of your generation. And he said, no, I don't. But Moishal the shoemaker, he knows. The students said, Moishal the shoemaker would know something that the great rabbi wouldn't. But OK, they would suspend this belief. So they all went to Moishal's very humble little you know, wooden shack. They didn't want to knock on the door because the premise seemed so preposterous to them. They sort of huddled outside decided to peek through the window and see maybe at some point Moishal would do something illuminating. And Moishal is sitting there, you know, eating a soup with a spoon and looking all kind of like gruff and grumpy. And at some point he puts down the spoon and he thuds on the table and his daughter comes and he says, bring me the books. The child comes with two books. One is a huge, fancy, leather-bound volume with you know golden leaves and the other is a scraggly little scrappy book just like cloth bound regular ordinary and Moishele looks up and says God it is time for me to read you the list of my sins and he takes the small scrappy book he opens it and he says, on this date, I charged three kopecks more for a pair of shoes. On this date, I was unkind to my wife. On this date, I needlessly yelled at my children. And so on and so forth it goes, a list of pretty ordinary transgressions. And he puts down the book and he sighs and says, and now God, I will read to you a list of your transgressions. And he takes the big leather bound volume and he opens it up very carefully and he says, in this day, you allowed a mother of six to perish in a fire. On this day, you let a plague claim the lives of six families. On this day, you let a war consume an entire village. And he goes on and on and on and on and reads these horrible, terrible things. And he puts the book away and he looks up and says, God, I'll make you a deal. If you forgive me my sins this year, I'll forgive you yours. And the students are looking through the window and they're astonished. They're like, oh my God, this man is so smart. And they run back to the rabbi Zusha with a spring in their steps and they say, you will never believe what happened. And Zusha said, tell me what happened. And they tell him the story. And Zusha starts weeping uncontrollably. They look at him and say, why are you crying? What happened, Rabbi? And he said, don't you understand? Moshe the shoemaker had God in the palm of his hand. He could have held him responsible for everything. And he let him go. <laughs> and so I want to show, if we may, hey, Chris, two visions. Um, of personal responsibility in the end times of redemption. On the left is Isaiah chapter 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all the nations shall flow onto it. As far as uh, an ecclesiastic type of, you know, great esch eschatological vision of utopia goes, this sounds pretty good. No more war, no more bloodshed. Micah, a later prophet, apparently agrees. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains and it shall be exalted above the hills and people shall fall onto it. Now, I, um, I'm also a journalist and there's a term for doing this. 
And let me tell you, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, advance your career very much because that is pretty much prophetic plagiarism. Onward to the next slide. And it goes on, this is very small print. Um, Isaiah, and many people shall go and say, come ye and let us go to the mountain of the Lord and the house of God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths for our, out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, says Micah. And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. For the laws go forth out of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, says Isaiah. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more, says Micah. And he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off, and they shall beat their swords into? Thank you. Um, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Concludes Isaiah. O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord, continues Micah. But they shall sit, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken it. For all people will walk, every one in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Right there in this difference between these two prophetic texts lies arguably the difference upon which, or the two rocks, upon which all political theory, upon which all ideas of governance, upon which all notions of personal responsibility are predicated. Do you believe that the end times, the utopian vision, is this moment in which all nations come together in a harmonious, quivering, shuddering moment in which we all become one back to our shared primordial human roots, dwelling together in the house of the Lord? Or do you believe that for the end times to be possible, you need to do the exact opposite, to sit in your own house, under your own fig tree, enjoy your own vine, and believe in your own God, understanding very well that your neighbor is a different tree, a different God, and a different vine. Do conservatives believe the latter and liberals the former? Do liberals believe the latter and conservatives the former? Are we looking at the foundations of the entire Western canon in these two texts? I believe we are, but confusion's about. Right there, less than 100 years apart, two incredibly competing, contrasting, irreconcilable visions of peace arise. The one calling us to drop all distinctions and all divisions and come together to the house of the Lord. The other telling us that only by respecting the contrast and the divisions will the house of the Lord ever be built. Which one you would rather choose is the topic of a great big fight. Thank you.